Now You Hear Us is a podcast that shares the voices of young people who have experienced displacement. From refugee camps to host communities, we'll be sharing our views, insight, and thoughts on displacement, migration, politics, mental health, identity, friendship, art, and love. Some content discussed in our show may include references to traumatic experiences including war, violence, abuse, sexism, and mental health issues, including depression and anxiety. Hello and welcome back to episode 3 of Now You Hear Us. The music you just heard was produced by Gracil, and you can check out his Instagram link in the bio below. We are really looking forward to sharing this episode with you today, and we want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen, share, and provide feedback. Today we are talking about responsibility, which I know is not black and white. After the fire on the island of Lesbos in Moria refugee camp in September, we, as in the youth advisory board members, who make up this podcast, met in an online meeting. We discussed the thousands of men, women, and children who were now sleeping on the streets, displaced once again, and we talked about who Who's responsible when it comes to caring for one another in this world? The following is a series of pieced together recordings from each of us, our own take on responsibility. We were also fortunate to be able to include a guest speaker named Daryush, a young man living on the island of Lesbos from Iran. So let's get started. Responsibility, if not me. If not you, then who? Hello everyone, Asifa's here. So today I'm gonna ask you some questions. And the first question will be, what are our responsibilities as a human beings? Have you ever asked yourself this question? Do you even know what is your responsibility as a human being? Actually, I'm very curious to know your answer. So today in this podcast, I'm going to tell you what my responsibility are as a human who lives in 2020 as well as some other thoughts on this. As you know, my name is Asifa and I'm 19 years old. I'm from Sinjar, Iraq, and I live in Germany now. Sinjar is a city for the Yazidi community in northern Iraq. In 2014, ISIS attacked my city, Sinjar. They killed many men. They asked Yazidi to convert to Islam or die. They took children from their families and taught the boys how to fight and train them to be soldiers for their army. The Islamic State did lots of horrible things to the women and girls, like what they did to Nadia Murad. Just imagine for once that girls and women, after killing their whole family, they are raped, beaten, used as sex slaves and sold in marketplace. They found more than 80 mass graves for Yazidi people, including men, women and children who were executed on the 3rd of August 2014. And thousands of them are still missing until now. We don't know anything about them. Do you realize that this all happened in 2014. A week ago in school, our history lesson was about World War II and what happened at that time in Germany and other countries. So I read the whole text and I even finished the whole unit. And I asked my teacher, are the dates correct? Because I've lived this myself just six years ago in 2014. The Islamic State did to ask what Adolf Hitler did to the Jewish community. So, are we gonna let history repeat itself 
over and over again. During these school lessons, I found a story called White Rose. It's a story about six students who were studying at the University of Munich in 1943, during World War II. So after Hans Scholl and Alexandra Schmuel knew what the Nazis did in Poland and what did they do to the Jewish people in concentration camps like Auschwitz, and how the Nazi treated them, they took action. The boat started to write leaflets and distribute them throughout the university and public places to show the people what the Nazis did to the Jewish and Polish people. After this, Hans' sisters Sophie Schul joined the White Rose as well and dissipate the dangers and horrors that could happen to them by distributing these leaflets, they never stopped. Even though they were German citizens and were safe at that time, they did something about it because they feel responsible for those people who were in concentration camps. They print more than 15,000 leaflets and on November 18, 1943, the Nazis cut Sophie and Hans while they were distributing the leaflets at the University of Munich. And on February 22, 1943, Sophie Scholl, Hans Scholz and Christopher were executed by Glatin. So, I share this story with you because these students even without enough papers or printers. And most of all, even though they knew it was legal and dangerous to share and distribute this information, they did and they risked their lives for those people living in the concentration camps. Do you know why? Because they feel the responsibility and they didn't normalize the concentration camps. They took action. So here's the question. Why are there more than 55 refugee camps in the world? Why we humans have all the possibilities and all the rights to speak, to share, to write, to record and to act? I don't share all of these with you because I'm a refugee who has experienced life as a refugee in Iraq, Greece and Germany. I share this with you all because I feel the responsibility as a human being. I don't think it's normal that 13,000 people who have lived in terrible condition for years in Moria camp in Greece and that they, they now have nowhere in this huge world to go. I believe that that is plenty of place on this planet for those children who live in refugee camps. So what I'm trying to say through this long conversation is that everyone is equal. Everyone matters. It doesn't matter the color of your skin or your religion or where you're from. And we must stop repeating the same history. So let's start to feel the responsibility and to take it seriously this time and to act. Let's do something about it. Let's take a huge step this time. I just want to remind you guys once again that we live in 2020. And my last war will be like always. We have space, we have space. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Daryush, I am 17 years old and I'm Iranian and I'm also living on the island of Lesbos. It has been almost a year and a half since I've been living in the Lesbos island of Greece with my family as a refugee. 
and I am going to share some of my experiences with you guys and yeah it like just generally talk about the responsibilities of other people uh, when it comes to the refugee issue. Now most of my experiences relate to the school environment but like as for the experience in the in the community and in the with local Greeks like outside school I would say that once one of my friends had lost a valet of his in a village in Lesvos and since I could speak a little Greek I started searching for the valet in the village um, I remember that I started searching the church next to which he had lost his valet so I went to the church and I started talking to the father of the church about the valet and he right looked me in the eyes and then I remember this very clearly that he told me that many refugees here are thieves and we should forget the valet now although that that he may have not known that I was a refugee but it wasn't right for him to say that in that way and generalize that many refugees are many refugees many refugees are thieves like there are these experiences that make you feel unwanted and that like they make you feel that no matter how hard you try and no matter what you do you will never be accepted as a citizen or as someone who lives in this country and like that's why so many people stop learning like so many refugees I would say stop learning the host country's language or host country's culture since they start be believing that like there is actually no point in it and no matter how they hard they try how hard they try they're not going to be accepted and like that in my opinion is their most important responsibility to accept us and even if they don't like refugees i want them to at least try um first when i came here after three months, I was registered into a public school and I started going there. So, kind of from the start, I started communicating with local Greeks and I met many new people, most of whom uh, helped me and wanted to help me however they could and taught me many new things. Um, like, now, in my opinion, uh, when it comes to the responsibility of people about the refugee issue I would say that the most important thing um, as I said to me at least is for them to accept us now I know that um, this is this is kind of their country and I know that we may not be welcome here for so many people but sooner or later if the European uh, officials Mm, except our asylum case of course uh, we will live in the country so we have to find a house we have to find a job and we have to make a living in other words at some point we refugees will have to enter the European so society and blend in and the sooner they accept us the faster and smoother that will happen um, is also kind of good to note that by accepting I mean for them not to not to ask very personal questions that will remind of our past and just quick note here that most of us refugees we want to forget about our past and we've kind of came here to Europe to build a new life and like it's for them to allow us live side by side with them and to generally accept that we are also human beings and we kind of don't want to be seen as a refugee for the rest of our lives and now I have a couple of examples of being in situations in which I felt like that the the locals didn't actually want me to be there or made fun of me and for different people these experiences will definitely have different effects but for me I would say that at least uh, they affected like they really affected my self-confidence and like they kind of made me feel down and like made me disappointed and stuff yeah so as i already mentioned 
it has been quite some time since I've been living in Lesbos with my family. And for those of you who don't know, uh, for around five years, Lesbos has been the Europe's entrance for refugees. Um, like usually refugees arrive here by boat and then they wait months, maybe even years, or actually in most cases years, for their asylum application to be processed. Now it is obvious that such a place will host many refugees and that's why Moria was built on Lesbos, a refugee camp which uh, like in la its last months of existence it nearly hosted 13,000 people like even during the coronavirus pandemic like and with a really terrible uh, living situation and like the thing is that this camp was actually designed for 3,000 people and like as I said like 13 and at some points even 20,000 people were living in it. Um, now Moria was burnt last month which was September and all those refugees stayed in streets for days till the government found a new spot for them which even has like the new spot is actually the the whole living situation in the new spot is way worse because in Moria at least they had some iso boxes they had some containers but this whole new spot was built in less than two weeks and they're all tents and since the winter is near and like the uh, these days the weather is rainy the whole living situation is not good and like the, the thing is that like after like after the fire European officials actually started acting and like started the like at least a li like they started at least trying and like they started dividing refugees between European countries and like the other thing is that the EU officials started moving and dividing refugees between the EU countries right after the fire took place. Right after all those people lived in streets for days and like if they if they could just do it before the fire then then like I don't know, all these people wouldn't have gone through such a hard time and like everything would have been much simpler. I remember that last year when I started first going to school, I couldn't speak much Greek. So either it was the language issue or the fact that I was a refugee that made me feel unwanted in the class in, in the class environment. For example, I remember that other students generally tried not to sit around me and uh, once I clearly remembered that I tried to sit next to one guy and he asked me to go and sit somewhere else. I mean, the guy didn't even know me and I was just starting to communicate with him. I just wanted to get to know him. But like, uh, he behaved in this way and I just changed my seat and I never ever tried again to sit uh, next to someone. Now for sure, I can't blame Greeks for this because no matter what, here is their country and they're the ones allowing us to be here they're the ones hosting us they're the ones giving us our food they're the ones like giving us electricity or whatever but these types of behaviors made me feel really uncomfortable and i literally wanted to quit school since i thought that like i wasn't wanted there uh, and another time, I actually remember being in the class and then the teacher, the teacher himself, started asking me personal questions like, why did I come here? Where do I live? And these questions sounded really weird to me because, and like, um, like they were, and I, I kind of felt like when I was answering the questions, other students were actually laughing and like they were making fun of me. And like, now I, now I would have felt much more comfortable if the teacher had asked me these types of questions in private. 
because I don't know like as I said we we generally try to forget our past and these types of questions especially like they, they, they remind us of what we have gone through like what we have done and like our life and everything and uh, there I just don't personally I don't feel really comfortable like talking in public about them Here is a refugee talking. I'm a refugee since 2014, I guess, as I remember. It was 13, I guess. <laughs> I don't even remember anymore. It's just has been a long time since I was home. I don't want to talk about where I came from, who I am what my name is because all that matters now is that I am a refugee I was a refugee in Turkey in Greece and now in Germany I am still a refugee it's so hard to get rid of that name <laughs> I don't know if it's I guess it is a name because every time people look at me the first question they ask me is where are you from? because I look different so they know I'm not from here it matters I guess where you came from so they want to know who you are so they can judge you know if you are a good person to talk to or not <laughs> it's just like this um I just want to talk about let I have a lot to talk about but let's focus on dreaming since this is the the second language after love that we all talk like we all have dreams we all have something somewhere someone maybe to reach that we want to reach. Well, come to think of it, I had a lot of dreams. <laughs> I, I mean, till now, I don't even know what I want exactly. I wanted a lot of stuff. Um, I just want to stop in Greece and talk about how hard it is or how hard it was on me to live in a tent two years in Greece and two years in Turkey so I had to work in Turkey when I was 13 um, I worked so hard it was so hard there uh, that's why we had to move to another country because I really wanted to go to school I was just looking around me and be like why like why not why I'm not at school why am I not like all of these kids in my age why not even that I knew the answer but in Greece um, I thought it was you know like it, it would be like different maybe I will be able to do anything else or something that I want, wanted to do, go to school, learn a language or something, but it was so bad. <laughs> um, at first I had to stay in a tent like on the border between Greece and Macedonia for like four, four months. Um, and then we moved to Thessaloniki for six months, also in a camp, in tents. And then we moved to Athens. It was not in the city, but like out of the city was, there was a camp 
culture to a camp. That's like I learned the language there. It's not like I, I mean English. Um, because why would I need to learn Greek, right? Because we were not even allowed to talk to people that much. Uh, not at first. The reason I wanted to learn English it was because I wanted to learn more about other people, cultures, kids. I don't know what people do there, how people live, how they study, how they, how they. I don't know, like anything. But we were just kept far away from people's eyes. We were just like, I don't know, treated differently. I thought it was normal back then because, you know, we don't talk their language. We don't live like them. We have different religions, religions, different thoughts. I thought it was normal to be far away from them, not to be like, not not to be in contact with them but why why do we have to be treated like that is it because we left our cities because of the war i don't know do they really think that we are some kind of psychopath or i don't know sick people or I don't know, maybe people who have to be under control. Or are they scared that we are going to get hurt? I don't know. I just, like, there are a lot of questions that I want to ask someone who knows better than me. Um, when we moved to Ritsuna camp, I started learning the language and getting in contact with American people. Spanish people, there were like some Greek people also in the camp, you know, like working there, volunteering, I don't know, working, whatever. So I was so happy. Like I was like, I forgot that I'm living in a camp. I forgot that I'm not going to school. I forgot about how shitty the situation was. I forgot it all just because I was learning something. Because I thought that I am doing something finally in my life. After after five years of not, of not going to school and working hard. And I don't know. Doing everything that I don't want it to do. Um, we left Greece. And we got here in Germany. In 2018. <laughs> I thought everything was going to be so perfect so maybe not easy but maybe possible is the word I had a dream of being a police officer because me leaving my country crossing the border and the borders and I don't know walking to other countries like literally walking I saw a lot of people getting hurt I saw a lot of people um, suffering I had like in Greece there was a really bad situation back then uh, I mean in maybe 2000 16 was that or 17 no it was 16 um people were like hitting each other and doing some horrible stuff because there was no food no water no clothes people cannot shower for like days um so i thought we are going to die <laughs> all of us there were like a lot of organizations, help organizations and so on, but it wasn't enough for that huge number of refugees. But I just want to talk about those people, those kids, those teenagers who are still in the camps, like living in a whole other world, like separated from 
the outside world. You are not protecting them. You are destroying them. Keeping them out, keeping, like, just not letting them to get con contact, like, to be with other people, it's destroying them. They have to feel normal. They have to feel like they are more than just someone who ran away without shoes to go to another country that they don't even know their language, they don't know nothing about them. It's hard, people. We just want you to understand that we don't want anything more than being, like, treated normal. They can go to school, they can dream. Even if they don't have shoes, they can dream of getting a car, getting a house. They can dream of being... He, that kid, that kid who is working, who is working in Turkey in the age 10, you can tell him he can be a doctor one day. It's so easy to talk to people this way. It's so easy to be nice. I just wanted to say that. Don't break someone's heart. Don't break their feelings. And don't destroy their dreams. This is it. We just want to be treated normal. Hello everyone, Hadaya here. As you know, I am from Syria, I'm 16 years old, and I live in Germany now. Today I'm going to talk about my opinion on the world's responsibility towards refugees. In my opinion, the main responsibility is to protect refugees because they need safe places where they can live. That's why they are in other countries. In their home countries, they might not have sufficient rights to study or to live in safety. And if they have nowhere else to live safely, then they need protection. This is the world's responsibility towards refugees because their lives are very hard. They might not have very much money. They always live under pressure and some of them fell from war and violence. They need protection because their lives are very difficult and they also want to be happy like other people. They need to study and to have opportunities to have a good future. To me, as a refugee girl, my life has been very difficult. Nevertheless, I'm trying to be well, I'm trying to be happy, to be confident and to imagine that there are always endless hopes and possibilities. I also have responsibilities like everyone else. I feel responsible to support my siblings with their homework, to make sure that they are happy, to make them feel safe, and to teach them that they should be responsible people as well. I also feel responsibility towards my parents, to respect them and help them whenever they need my help. I also have responsibility towards neighbors, to respect them, to support them if they need help, because one day I might need help from them as well. If no one feels responsible towards their fellow humans, then there wouldn't be any development within society, because if you have your own resources and you don't share them with other people and other people also don't share their resources with you, then no one will benefit from each other. These days, refugee camps are normalized because there aren't enough places in other countries to send the refugees to. But in my opinion, this is something very terrible because the situation is becoming worse because of COVID-19. 
Camp conditions are horrible. There aren't enough toilets, washing machines, enough clothes, money, and so on. The people living in these camps don't have jobs because they don't have the opportunity to work. They are living under pressure and there is also a lot of bullying happening. There are a lot of possibilities to change this situation, like in the Camp Moria on Lesbos that just burned down. Why can't every country distribute the refugees? In Moria, there are almost 12,000 people. And if we had 12 countries, then every country can take in 1,000 people. I'm sure that in every country there are places for 1,000 people. And this way, the situation can be changed because people won't be able to bully each other anymore. They will have the chance to go to school or work, the, to receive support and live in safety. The last thing I want to say to every refugee is be confident, stay strong, and imagine that there are endless, endless hopes. It was a moonlight, as I remember it, when I opened my eyes and saw myself inside that little rubber boat. I could not accept that my story was over. All around me I saw a black sea that was full of impossible dreams, full of restless waves, that with each drop of tears added to it, making it more turbulent. Three years later, and I still remember every second of that day. I remember the time of sunrise, when we landed, the day I first set foot in Moria refugee camp. We entered a large tent, and when I saw that crowd, I was speechless. And the question kept popping into my mind, how, in a world where everyone breathes freedom, how are there still people who have to live in this situation? And I was one of them. One of those people who had to live in that situation. All those crowds slept together in a tent. And I do not even want to remember how hard it was to get through that time. The fact that it is difficult for me to explain my feelings, that I'm still thinking about my past, after a few years, is for no other reason than the difference I feel in myself. I've tried, and I still try, every day, to be like the people around me, to be like a normal teenager, to accept these differences and live with them. But the fact is, the more I try, the more I drown, the more I'm confused. When and where did it start? Who chose which country the people were forced to immigrate to? Who's really above another human being? And when is this story going to end? I believe we've been taught to mention humanity only in books. We've been taught how to classify human beings and even how to look at people with different appearances and to respect them only as much as their financial situation allows. We live in an age where we can be aware of everything that is happening in the world and we all have a platform to share our thoughts and opinions. So my question is, do we make the most of the opportunity we have? How much do we promote love? Have we come to believe that all human beings have equal rights? We feel enlightened, but why do we not react to injustice? Why are we silent? Why do we think that only some people deserve to live and that those who have no right to their own land should live in tents, to die in every corner of the world without having a voice to be heard? Why did we 
classify people? Why did we allow ourselves to invade someone's land? How was colonialism and humanity accepted in and by us? How did war and the injustice of colonialism, murder, rape become words that we ignore? How did we accept that children are sleeping on the ground? People do not have the right to live in their homeland. Children who do not have the right to education and a home? We are used to seeing the news and ignoring it, to talking about humanity only in our speeches. This is the worst thing that has happened to humans. And what if we were just human beings and the religion was the religion of humanity and none of these beliefs that have been forced in our hearts existed today? And what does empathy mean? Being responsible to people whose names we do not even know seems to have no meaning for us. And we just talk and talk and talk. Words will never end, but the life of these people will. I believe we were not born for this. Each of us has responsibilities as a family. We must love and care for each other like a family. And just like in a family, if someone's hurt, we will not leave them. We should not leave the injured people of this world alone. So why did we leave the family members who needed us? Why did we remain silent when they were oppressed? Why do we remain silent in the face of inequality and injustice in a world where we all speak of justice and equal rights? Why are there so many refugee camps around the world, even in countries that speak of global justice? Do we all see that the politics of today's world is full of people who think of nothing but money and are still silent? This is not the real meaning and concept of justice. Will a day come when we all see true justice? I hope so, for the sake of all those children who are sacrificed for the sake of all the mothers, I hope so. Thank you for joining us today and for taking the time to listen and to hear us. Now You Hear Us is made with the support of Amplifying Sanctuary Voices a community-based oral history project centering the stories of Bay Area residents who have come to the U.S. Seeking Sanctuary. Check them out by clicking on the link below. The photo used for this episode was taken by me, your host, Pawi. Editing and production of this podcast was done by the co-founder of Youth Unmuted, Daphne Morgan. <laughs>